Oke. Okay. Ya, kita mulai ya. Uh, tadi saya ulangi tadi kalian, kalian eh, kemarin kita kita itu maksudnya saya sudah menjelaskan dan kalian sudah mempresentasikan tentang eh, apa sih yang terjadi di arsitektur eklektisme gitu ya jadi eh, dia adalah awal dari arsitektur modern awal itu dari, eh, kayak garis batas orang sudah tidak berpikir lagi dengan cara eklektisme eh sudah tidak berpikir lagi dengan cara klasik berpikir dengan cara yang berbeda gitu kan dan itu itu cikal bakal dari cara berpikir eh, masyarakat modern sehingga kalau masyarakat modern ruang yang harus kita ciptakan untuk mewadahi masyarakat itu manusia itu adalah ruang-ruang yang eh, berkonsep modern nah kemudian dari segi bentuk kita masih melihat mirip-mirip gitu ya karena ada eh, ada periode eklektisme nah, mereka mengeklek menggabung-gabung yang sudah ada nah sekarang eh, tahap berikutnya adalah tahap di mana orang sudah sudah apa namanya sudah betul-betul meninggalkan bentuk-bentuk uh, klasik kemudian mereka me melahirkan bentuk-bentuk baru gitu ya nah sekarang mari kita mempelajarinya kalau suara saya kurang jelas kalian bisa langsung potong ya saya bisa yang ini di bawah Mana nih? Oke, jadi topik yang kedua ini early modernism. Jadi kalau kemarin itu titik batas gitu ya, apa namanya titik batas dari klasik berpindah kepada satu garis. Uh, di mana garis itu ada eklektisme like gitu ya uh, kemudian di sini itu sudah sudah awal jadi benar-benar modern itu luar dalam cara berpikir yang modern lebih modern gitu kan nah ini di sini mana deh anotasinya kok nggak muncul dah 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 hmm. nah ini kelihatan ya Jadi ini 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 teori ya karena saya kan apa namanya menggunakan dasar itu teori. Nah kemudian bersama-sama saya dan kamu kita akan menggunakan dasar-dasar logika pada saat nanti tahap-tahap kita menganalisis kasus gitu ya. Nah ini di dalam teori itu ada periode, ada ada apa ya ada kelompok besar gitu ya. Rise modernism in Europe and Rusia gitu ya. Terus kemudian ada lagi yang early jadi di Europe dan Rusia itu menurut mereka 1918 1931. Nah, kemudian Amerika itu 1890. Nah, kemudian Eropa itu 1900. Ini periode yang kita pelajari. Nah. Nah, pertanyaannya kenapa Amerika kok lebih dulu dibanding Eropa di posisi early modernism? Yuk. Buka anunya, mic-nya jawab suka-suka kalian jawab apa? tapi kenapa sih di Eropa belakangan kenapa menang Amerika gitu? kenapa duluan Amerika? Wait, guys buka speakernya dong. karena kemajuan teknologinya bu. oke okay. sebut nama ya soalnya aku nggak lihat di sini namanya. oh iya Coba. laras bu laras. laras. selain selain laras lagi, ayo jangan mau kalah. Ini mumpung ini loh, mumpung yang presentasi Bu. saya dan kalian sambil celemang-celemang boleh. Oke ya, siapa tadi? Hmm? Oh, iya. Mega Bu. Bu tapi okay. saya agak ngasal ya Bu. Tapi saya eh, mikir waktu itu ya. Bu Santi pernah ngomong hmm, gitu. Boleh Kost, ngasal. Eh, karena, kalau menurut saya karena Eropa kan mereka masih terikat banget sama norma-norma arsitektur yang kayak klasiknya dulu hmm. gitu kan Bu. Pikirannya hmm. terus eh, masih ada keluarga aristokrat juga. Hmm. Nah terus Amerika kan waktu itu ditemuin karena orang-orang hmm. di sana tuh yang dalam tanda kutip mereka tuh hmm. uh, orang miskin di Eropa terus pindah ke Amerika hmm. kan hmm. jadi mungkin mereka berpikirnya lebih progresif mungkin bu hmm. oke okay. jadi terus. lebih cepat gitu jadi hmm. terus kemudian siapa lagi yang mau ngasih pendapat hmm? 
Siapa lagi? Eh, cowok-cowok kalian nggak malu tuh di kalian cewek-cewek, woi. Halo? Wah, cowoknya lemot. Halo? Ini ada cowoknya nggak sih? Jangan-jangan aku berteriak-teriak tidak ada cowoknya. Ya, Bu. Ya, cepat. Komen. Mewakili para cowok. Masa di ini diselip dua cewek loh. Ini ngapain Jangan sih itu. saya dosen kok ngomongin gender ya? Aneh. Ya, yang jelas. Kalau Amerika mm -hmm. secara... Uh, apa gen dan pemikiran lebih maju bu dibandingkan negara lainnya seperti itu ini siapa nih yang jawab aku garan garan. Uh, garan yang lain ada yang mau komen ya uh, ya begini ada satu yang berbeda gitu ya dari dari pergerakan di modernisme ini bahwa sebetulnya satu tempat dan tempat lain itu tidak tidak berbeda jauh kenapa karena Waktu itu sudah ada kapal api ya, kapal uap, kapal api ya. Ini namanya kapal uap ya. Kapal api kan, anu ya. Kopi. Kopi. Ya, ya salah salah. Kapal api, kapal uap gitu kan. Terus kemudian eh, apa? Perdagangan antar gitu kan sudah mulai. Nah, eh, kalau dibilang teknologi yang satu dikirim ke teknologi yang lain, nggak nggak beda jauh sih sebetulnya ya. Di periode ini kan juga apa namanya Indonesia juga udah sudah apa namanya eh belum ya 1900 mah kita lagi apa tuh. Nah kalau di Eropa dan Amerika begitu waktu itu memang sudah sebetulnya udah nggak nggak beda jauh karena yang membawa membawa ke Amerika itu juga orang-orang Eropa begitu ya. Cuman bahwa Amerika lebih dulu hampir-hampir uh, seperti yang dikatakan oleh Mega ya jadi uh, Amerika kan nggak punya nggak uh, punya akar nggak punya akal culture sementara Eropa itu sudah sudah apa ya mendarah daging heritage itu sehingga tadi kenapa kok dia lebih dulu uh, kemudian ini lebih dulu karena saat 1800 ini di Amerika sudah uh, ada bahan baru teknologi baru dari revolusi industri tapi ada teknologi baru segala macam gitu ya ilmu baru segala macam mereka langsung bergerak sementara di Eropa dengan gerakan yang sama informasi yang sama bahan yang sama teknologi yang sama mereka masih melalui proses eklektisme jadi kalau nanti kalian kemarin kan sudah mengerjakan eklektisme jadi sebetulnya kalau kalian menyadari bahwa mungkin kalian tidak akan menemukan karya eklektisme di Amerika karena saat saat Eropa sedang eklektisme, Amerika sudah mulai modernisme gitu ya. Ya, akar masalahnya apa? Akar masalahnya seperti kata Mega dia dia tidak punya aristokrat. Kemudian tadi si Laras bilang apa Laras tadi lupa aku. Teknologinya lebih maju, Bu. teknologi. Kalau teknologi dan anu ini posisinya hampir sama. Karena informasi koran berita dan segala macam telegram terutama setelah ditemukan telegram kan revolusi industri itu berita-berita ada arsitek baru dan sebagainya itu sudah diterima dengan lebih cepat antara sekolah yang ada di Amerika dan sekolah yang ada di Eropa. Cuman waktu itu bahwa sudah ditemukan bahan bangunan ini, ayo kalau mau beli segini gini gini. Nah yang di Amerika beli langsung mendesainnya ya langsung yang apa follow form follow function kan orangnya lima 100 harus ditempatkan bangunan 500 dan sementara di Eropa mereka masih melalui proses eklektisme. Nah, kalau yang ini Eropa dan Rusia itu ini periode ini ini nanti harus dibuktikan pakai peta. Kalau kecurigaan saya sih ini wilayah Eropanya yang yang berbatasan dengan Rusia gitu. Kalau kemudian yang ini yang Eropa yang dimaksud di sini itu adalah Eropa yang di sisi yang negaranya masih tadi kata Mega masih aristokrat dan sebagainya. Gitu. Oke, okay, nah gantian yang kemarin kalian presentasi, sekarang saya yang presentasi. Uh, saya mengambil kasus ini, Glasgow School of Art, ini Charles Rennie Macintosh. Kenapa? Karena kalau dengar namanya Macintosh, kita juga kebayang Mac ya, atau Mac gitu ya. Tapi ini kan jauh banget, 1800, dia nggak kebayang bahwa akan bikin iPhone atau uh, iMac gitu, bukan. Tapi waktu itu memang, hmm, apa ya, saat revolusi industri, si Rennie Macintosh ini justru justru mengkritisi bahwa copy paste dari bahan-bahan yang ada itu. Jadi dari bahan teknologi yang ada supaya murah bentuknya sama itu kemudian di copy paste desainnya itu sudah sudah dikritisi oleh si Rene Macintos bahwa enggak enggak baguslah gitu ya. Enggak apa ya. Ya dia sudah enggak mau barang kodian yang kembarannya banyak gitu kan. 
Nah, kemudian ini Glasgow School of Art. Nanti di situ kita akan melihat bahwa konsepnya ini, konsep antara teknologi, seni, dan sebagainya itu dia mencoba melakukan ala seniman dan ala engineer. Bahwa ruang di dalamnya itu sangat berbeda dengan di luarnya, tapi tetap ada elemen-elemen teknologi, kemudian bentuk satu dan lainnya itu apa namanya perubahannya seperti apa. Nah ini nanti kita mencoba berkunjung secara virtual ke Glasgow School of Art. Ini desainnya gitu ya masih masih ini kenapa gini ya oh ya oke okay. ini desainnya dia pernah terbakar gitu ya dan kayak kayaknya meskipun saya bukan penggemar Harry Potter kayaknya gedungnya model-model kayak sekolah sekolahnya Harry Potter gitu ya nah dalamnya juga kayak gitu isinya kayu gitu bahannya gitu karena dia dia menolak menolak bentuk-bentuk uh, yang copy paste jadi di dalam sama di luar tuh beda banget gitu dia nggak mau yang sama. Nah ini kita tonton di sini aja. Nah, kita anu dulu. Kita kasih CV jadi kita berkunjung ke sana ini secara virtual sambil dijelasi admin oleh guide-nya yang menjelaskan tentang bangunan ini waktunya 9 menit. Jadi kamu siap-siap bawa Cemilan. That the Glasgow School of Art considers the influence of the design of that building by Charles Rennie Mackintosh in an extra program tonight from the series Building Sites. This is one of the greatest modern buildings in Europe. By blending completely different styles together, using traditional methods as well as inventing new ones, its designer took architecture in the 10 years it took to put up the building out of the 19th century and into the 20th. I was a full-time student here at the Glasgow School of Art in the early 60s. But before that, from the age of six, I attended Saturday morning classes here. I can't think of a better start for a young artist than to work in a building which is in fact a masterpiece. Something of the building, whether it be the light, space, or attention to detail, must rub off on you. And it's only recently that I've actually realized the enormity of the influence the building has had upon me. I'm sure that the reason the building has worked a magic on me has a lot to do with the way in which Macintosh, inside as well as outside the building, has mastered the whole range of materials which he's chosen to work with. There's glass, iron, wood, and of course, stone. You could say this craftsman-like approach is even discernible in the young Macintosh's meticulous dandified appearance. The architect was barely out of his twenties when he began to work in the school. Macintosh's genius, though, wasn't so much in perfecting different individual materials as in blending them all together. He was the first of a new breed an architect designer for whom there was no distinction between the inside and the outside of a building. For example, in this total vision, the light fittings in the library are reminiscent of other parts of the building, almost as if they're miniatures of the vast windows and facades on the outside, or even like small-scale models of the whole building itself. 
Of course, you can look at this the other way around and see the whole building as a possible light fitting. In the same way, this covering stonework can be related to the same shape in this detail on a wooden cabinet. What makes this correspondence between the different elements all the more remarkable is the way in which Macintosh juggles with form. For instance, not only do the four main facades differ in scale and style, as if they belong to different buildings, but taken individually, they make a virtue of being asymmetrical. Just look at how, within a few feet of each other, these four windows manage to come in all shapes and sizes. In Macintosh's world, there may be similarities, but no two things are ever quite alike. And that even applies to the smaller aspects. Take me anywhere blindfold in the School of Art, and I'd know where I was from the change in detail, as with these ceramics and the landings of the side staircases. Whatever its variety and difference, the school is still a unity in the way it blends different influences together. On the top of the building, you could be in the Scottish baronial tradition. While lower down, there's much more of a mainstream European feel. The relationship between European Art Nouveau and Macintosh was very strong. But there are Eastern influences too, as can be seen in his use of these Japanese heraldic devices, or mon. It's a tragedy about these unsuitable net curtains. Whatever Glasgow does around the School of Art, the building remains a strong physical presence, dominating the heart of the city. From the many vantage points and windows in the school itself, you can build up a picture of the rest of Glasgow. It's almost as if the building would like to take possession of the whole of the city, making it its own. Macintosh naturally placed the studios facing north, all the better to let in an even light throughout the day. These spaces are grandiose and optimistic, which can only encourage good work. The scarlet above the central staircase also maximizes a natural soft light. One of the most important features in the Macintosh building, in my opinion, is this magnificent central staircase, which was conceived in such a way as to be a space not that you pass through, but you could sit, stand, talk, and interact. These central stairs are the building's lifeblood, and with the side staircases, they form an easy set of connections with the main corridors, of which are to be found many of the studios. Into this dynamic of corridors, stairs and studios, Macintosh built spaces where you could be more contemplative if you wanted to be. The library, of course, is where you can find permanent peace and quiet. What an area for reading and contemplation. It's one of the glories of the building, a masterpiece in wood. The irony is that the contemplative, sedentary life was forced upon Macintosh. By his 40s, his best architectural work was behind him. 
It was difficult for him to earn a living in Britain, which was totally indifferent to his visionary approach. He died in 1928, years before his work became appreciated. It's not nostalgia that brings me here, nor the fact that it's become extremely fashionable in the last few years to pay homage to Charles Rennie Macintosh. It's the positive feeling of the building. And it's a tragedy that in these times, none of our internationally acclaimed architects will be invited to design a school of art that will take us from the 20th century into the 21st century, the way that Macintosh took us with great positiveness from the 19th century to the 20th century. di gambaran tentang uh, yang orang-orang yang apa namanya yang seniman di masa itu Glasgow School of Art itu juga nggak mau main-main copy paste gitu ya karena tadi ya sama seperti kamu lah gitu ya kalau kamu bisa lihat nggak mungkin kamu mau beli uh, apa baju yang ada di pasar yang banyak kembarannya karena kamu tahu betul gitu ya bahwa uh, kamu nggak sama dengan orang lain gitu. Nah ini, suara saya kedengaran cukup jelas ya. Ini uh, yang dimaksud yang Reni Macintosh. Jadi di akhir 19 itu dia melakukan reaksi terhadap kopis. Oh, jadi kebiasaan mengkopi kopi itu dia dia tolak gitu ya Macintosh. Kebayang nggak sih? Uh, dia yang maksudnya dia leader dalam dalam teknologi tapi dia nggak mau teknologi itu di, di copy paste menjadi hal yang apa ya yang jadi nggak bernilai gitu. Nah kemudian uh, ini di Eropa dia pakai Art Nouveau, kemudian nanti di Perancis ada lagi namanya, di Jerman ada lagi namanya. Saya nggak ingat tuh nama namanya, tapi akhirnya sekelompok mereka sekelompok uh, orang itu nggak nggak mau pakai yang yang kembar lagi, kemudian dia membuat kayak gerak. Nuvo itu kayak kalau nggak salah pembaruan. Jadi seni yang baru, gerakan seni yang baru dan sebagainya. Jadi dia dia meskipun uh, arsitek modern, dia tidak mau uh, rasa seni itu hilang. Dan tujuan dari ini, dari gerakan ini dia dia mau menciptakan style yang baru gitu kan. Ini sekitar 1810 1910. Hmm. Nah itu apa ya gerakan itu dimulai dari Glasgow School of Art kemudian oke okay. ini ceritanya tentang ini nah ini kita bicara tadi tentang Amerika yang lebih dulu lebih dulu mengen, kita kenal sekarang itu lebih duluan ini bikin bikin bangunan bangun itu bayang nggak sih ini William Winslow ini bikinnya 1893 1800 itu kan di Eropa masih eklektisme ya nah dia sudah sudah seperti ini begitu ini, ini sengaja saya kasih linknya dan kalian nanti bisa langsung klik cari informasinya Franco itu ada di mana. Ini sengaja saya tetap nggak saya hilangkan linknya supaya kalian bisa bisa membuka ini kemudian bisa mencari data yang ada. Nah pada saat itu 1800 ini mereka sudah mulai seperti ini dan 1914 lah ya ini data yang saya ambil itu data tahun ini. Kemudian kita bandingkan pada tahun 1900 itu. Nah, ini yang ini. Jadi kita sudah tahu bahwa ini sudah sudah modern ya dengan bangunan berlantai 1 2 3 4 5 6 ini sudah modern. Ini sudah kelihatan lah ya. ini apalagi. Tapi eh, tadi detail-detail yang seperti ini itu masih masih ada karena dia mengalami eklektisme tadi ya 1900. Hmm, ini fungsi-fungsi baru. Jadi se, apa namanya? sudah menjadi apa? Sudah dipastikan ya kalau dia adalah periode ini adalah periode fungsi-fungsi baru modern. Nah, kemudian kita bisa kita bisa rasain tuh sama-sama 1900 tapi masih banyak ketemu yang begini-begini gitu ya. Nah, kemudian ini nih 1800. Uh, ini tadi di Amerika ya, di New York ini 1800 itu dia sudah seperti ini nih. Prudensial gitu ya. Ini mulai bangunan-bangunan pencakar langitnya nih. Ini 1900 tapi ini 1800. Jadi Begitulah yang terjadi saat di belahan dunia itu. Jadi mereka balok-balok kubus gini itu langsung familiar. Kata Pak, efisien, bisnis semua, jangan kebanyakan apa sumber daya yang dibuang dan menghasilkan 
pengeluaran yang lebih besar. Jadi mereka 1896 ini sudah seperti ini. Gitu. Ini beberapa tokoh yang apa ya yang sampai sekarang itu masih 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 kita idolakan gitu ya dia. Ada Walter de Gropius, ada Miss Van der Rohe, ada Le Corbusier. Le Corbusier ini yang yang menjadi favorit favorit banyak orang, salah satunya saya. Uh, tahun segitu ini semua pada libur ya, semua lahir tahun 18-an ya. 1818 gitu ya. Jadi dia dia mengalami masa eklektisme tapi pada pada periode perkembangannya nanti kita lihat ya 1800 dia mengalami eklektisme tapi masa pada masa perkembangannya dia salah satunya nih loh nanti di Le saya tunjukin dia menciptakan sebuah uh, ajaran teori tentang lima hal yang arsitektur modern di masa itu yang itu masih masih sangat relevan sampai sekarang jadi kalau kamu nanti TA pakai tiga lima prinsip itu der bagus banget katanya dan yang luar biasa lagi prinsip itu tuh di, diungkap dan dijelaskan tuh dengan cara yang sederhana yang simpel Jadi jadi di zaman manapun gitu kita akan merasa bahwa oh iya ya nggak nggak sulit memahami teori arsitektur modern serumit apapun desain yang harus kita pecahkan sehubungan dengan kompleksnya hubungan ruang kompleksnya aktivitas tapi konsep arsitektur modern itu menjadi sangat sederhana untuk Le Corbusier nanti saya tunjukin. Dari dari saya penggemar Le saya penggemar Le Corbusier jadi saya sangat sangat apa ya sangat me, mengidolakan dia saat saya me, me, ingin membagi sebuah teori jadi Le Corbusier itu begitu sederhana teorinya simple tapi dengan kesimpulan itu bisa menjadi sebuah desain yang uh, apa ya unik. Saya sering mengingatkan diri saya, kalau saya paham betul tentang sesuatu yang memang sedang saya kerjakan, harusnya saya mampu memberi sebuah penjelasan yang sederhana. Kenapa? Karena aku muteng banget. Nah, aku muteng banget itu berarti aku tuh ngomongnya harusnya dengan cara lebih simpel gitu loh. Nah, itu itu saya belajar dari Le Corbusier nanti saya tunjukin kamu. Jadi saya sering bilang tuh kalau ada orang-orang pinter, pinter, tapi ngomongannya rumit banget nggak bisa Saya tuh kadang-kadang suka mikir. Emang kamu paham betul nggak sih gitu ya? Karena tadi nanti kita lihat Le Corbusier itu dengan karyanya yang sangat apa ya, yang sangat eh, apa, sangat mempesona itu dia punya konsep zaman pul ratusan tahun yang lalu itu eh, menjelaskannya sangat sederhana. Nah, ini ini gaya-gaya internasional yang yang sudah umum ya, yang punyanya Le Corbusier. Ini punya siapa ya lupa aku. Ini punyanya Corbusier juga. Nah, ini mulai, mulai kita mengenal yang form follow function gitu kan, yang uh, ornamen-ornamen dihilangkan dan sebagainya. Nah, oke. Okay. Ini ada dua video. Uh, saya akan potong-potong saat mendengarkan, tapi kamu boleh nonton nanti sendiri. Terutama pada saat ini, saya akan potong-potong saat menjelaskannya supaya uh, yang enggak mahir dan sebagainya biar bisa mengikuti ya. Tadi soalnya waktu perkuliahan pertama saya biarin nonton, ada yang mudeng ada yang enggak terus cepat-cepat saya ulangi lagi. Jadi ini supaya anu, supaya efisien saya tuker. Saya jelaskan dulu sambil video saya potong sambil video saya potong saya jelaskan. Kalau kalian nanti pengen nonton sendiri, nah kalian bisa ini, bisa cari linknya gitu ya. Hmm. Saya Oh dia nggak bisa di sisi ya? Oke, okay, berarti saya memang harus menjelaskan tanpa teks soalnya. Suaranya udah masuk belum ya? Udah. Oh, udah. Hmm. Mana ini tadi? Jadi ini Le Corbusier itu salah satu di antara apa ya arsitek yang dikenal sangat apa sangat revolusioner dalam membuat sebuah konsep tentang dasar-dasar arsitektur modern. Nah dia 
dokumen yang ditemukan tentang jadi dia lepo bursi kalau zaman dulu tuh arsitek itu ya juga seorang peneliti sehingga uh, bagaimana dia menemukan lim, uh, sebuah teori mengenai lima dasar-dasar uh, berpikir tentang arsitektur modern ini idenya dia itu sudah memikirkan bahwa bagaimana sih kelak kita uh, manusia akan hidup di masa industrialisasi jadi tahun 1929 ini dia sudah menciptakan teori yang akhirnya setiap kali dia gunakan untuk mendesain rumah baik rumah tunggal maupun rumah apa namanya rumah apartemen dan sebagainya itu menjadi ini menjadi apa sangat indah dan berfungsi optimal. Ada lima lima konsep ya lima poin di dalam uh, uh, arsitektur yang baru menurut dia arsitektur baru kalau kita sekarang anggapnya arsitektur modern. Yang pertama bangunan itu building itu diangkat gitu diangkat dari dasarnya. Jadi bangunan itu diangkat supaya tadi bangunan ini bangunannya diangkat supaya bagian bawah itu bisa digunakan untuk pergerakan uh, kendaraan. Jadi di masa itu saat jalanan belum mati terjadi udah mikir ada basement gitu ya ada ada tempat kendaraan di bagian bawah bangunan. Konsep yang kedua, desain itu jadi di bagian ground plan ya, jadi bagian dasar yang untuk apa dena itu menjadi lebih bebas. Kenapa? Karena tadi kan nggak usah mikir sirkulasi. Ini bisa dilakukan karena sejak awal seorang arsitek sudah memikirkan bagaimana konstruksi dasarnya lebih dulu. Sehingga bentuk bangunannya itu bisa menjadi lebih bebas in any way. Di lantai manapun dengan cara apapun bentuknya. Kalau konstruksinya sudah dipikirkan, kemudian kita bisa membuat bentuk bangunan dengan lebih bebas in any way, di, di lantai 1, 2, 3, lebih bebas. Konsep yang ketiga itu uh, mengatakan bahwa uh, fasad tam, tampak depan, uh, tampak luar itu bisa menjadi bebas. gitu ya. Nah, bagaimana bisa, bagaimana membuat tampak penampilan bangunan yang lebih bebas dengan memisahkan Uh, tadi uh, konstruksi strukturnya tadi yang sudah dipisahkan, dipisahkan antara strukturnya konstruksinya dengan uh, tampak depannya itu jadi dengan apa tampilan luar keempat nih konsepnya. Nah, dengan fasad atau kulit luar bangunan yang yang bebas karena dia tidak menempel di konstruksi, kita jadi bisa membuat jendela yang horizontal. Jadi zaman dulu kan jendela selalu vertikal-vertikal tuh. Karena apa? Kalau horizontal kan nabrak kolomnya. Nah, sekarang dia bisa bilang, nah, kalau kolomnya udah dilepas gitu ya, konstruksi dilepas dengan kulit luarnya, kita bisa bikin jendela yang horizontal. Jendelanya bisa apa ya bisa tidur gitu ya. Nah ini yang kelima 
yang kelima itu betul-betul apa ya baru baru kita baru ngomong-ngomongin sekarang tapi menurut uh, Le Corbusier itu sudah harus dipikirkan bahwa atap itu harus digunakan uh, atap itu idealnya itu uh, atap itu harus berupa roof garden gitu atap itu harus berupa taman karena menurut dia kita harus mengembalikan uh, hak alam kan kita udah pakai tanah udah pakai uh, area space untuk bangunan. Nah, Leko Bu sudah ngingetin kembalikan haknya kalau tadi kita bikin rumah 500 meter persegi ya di bagian atapnya itu dikasih taman yang bisa mengembalikan hak alam tadi. Keren banget kan? Ada yang mau komen? Eh, gini dulu. Sudah paham belum konsep 5 konsep Le Corbusier? Halo? Sudah bisa ditangkap nggak konsepnya Le Corbusier tadi? Paham, Bu. Hmm. Oke, okay. semua paham ya. Jadi nggak perlu diulang ya. Dan itu simpel. Sederhana banget ya jelasinnya ya. Tapi itu menjadi sangat apa ya? Sangat spektakuler waktu itu ya karena tadi dia dia mikirin sirkulasi dia mikirin green arsitektur dia mikirin pencahayaan dia mikirin keseimbangan antara uh, bidang uh, transparan dan bidang masif gitu ya jendelanya jadi panjang gitu ya itu kalau kalian bisa bisa megang prinsip itu dalam setiap desain itu menurut saya sampai sekarang itu belum ada tandingannya deh even toh si Zaha Hadid yang bentuknya spektakuler dan sebagainya, Le Corbusier tetap tetap idul aku. <laughs> Oke, okay, sekarang kita kembali ke kita kembali ke yang video yang kedua. Ini pakai bahasa Perancis, tapi dia lebih ini, lebih dia dia kasih tahu zoning. Jadi dia dia ngajarin kalian kalau bikin zoning, mungkin sekarang masih ada yang salah loh. Bikin zoning servis itu merah di sini, kemudian di tengah ada zoning semi publik. Nah ini ini diajarin bahwa Le Corbusier selalu menempatkan satu zoning itu nggak pecah-pecah. Jadi kalau satu zoning servis ya satu area itu servis semuanya. Kenapa sih itu? Ya itu supaya efisien. Itu pikiran orang modern. Kalau zoningnya jadi satu, berarti kebutuhan untuk me, apa ya menampung yang ada di zoning itu nggak nggak terpisah-pisah, nggak jadi double gitu kan? Nah ini, ini nggak ada suara kalau ini, jadi nggak bisa di sisi. Tapi huruf-hurufnya pakai bahasa Perancis, cuman kita bisa nampak-nampak aja lah. Jadi saya nggak akan jelasin. Tapi tadi yang yang perlu ditonton dari sini adalah bagaimana penzoningan-penzoningan itu begitu efisien oleh si Le Corbusier.
Oke, okay. ada yang mau komen? Apa yang biasanya anu. Lucy ya? Kamu double enggak Lucy ya? Lucy Novia double enggak kuliahnya? Mega Laras LV, ada kemba, ada komen? Pendapatmu apa tentang konsepnya Le Corbusier atau bukan konsepnya ya? Tentang apapun tentang Le Corbusier. Elvi, Mega, Laras. Kalian boleh double ya? Eh, suara saya kedengeran nggak sih? Iya, Bu. Double, Bu. Oh, oke okay lah. Oh ini, wah ya kalian dulu double ya, harus tonton aja menang ya. Tak tontonin ini dua dua video. Jadi kalau tadi Le Corbusier eh, apa namanya membuat sebuah eh, rumah tinggal yang tunggal, ya, ini dia mendesain rumah tinggal eh, untuk banyak orang gitu ya. Jadi dia mau memindahkan orang-orang ke dalam ke sebuah apartemen gitu ya. Eh, nanti di sini dijelasin nih bagaimana konsepnya bahwa Uh, ini, ini, ini kayaknya ada fungsi, bukan kayaknya ya nanti dijelasin bahwa uh, public space itu diletakkan di bagian tengah-tengah di antara dan sebagainya nanti nanti kita belajar tentang hal itu. Completed in 1952. Units 80 Habitation is a communal housing complex designed by Le Corbusier in Marseille, France. This project was the first by Le Corbusier that took the jump from single family housing and villas to communal housing. Le Corbusier was employed to design the complex to provide housing for the masses that were displaced by the bombings and warfare of the Second World War. While Marseille itself was not inside the region of German occupied territory, the center of France's government, Paris, was captured and the entire nation felt the effects of this loss. In addition, many battles and operations left buildings crumbled in the city to straw as a whole. With this being his first project of such large scale, Le Corbusier envisioned a vertical city that operated entirely within the volume of his design. With the functions of the city all within the walls of his structure, the area around the building could be left natural for residents to enjoy. As the building was meant to contain all of the functions of the city, it hosts both private quarters and communal spaces for all residents. Eating, shopping, exercising, and gathering. These public spaces were found on the 7th and 8th floors, as well as a rooftop, leaving the rest of the building to be organized into private residences. When designing these spaces, Le Corbusier looked to his Le Modulor proportion study in order to make decisions. such as the ceiling height of 2.26 meters, which is also the height of the end of the modular's hand when raised. However, there were more forces at play, and with many people desperately needing housing, the units were elongated and narrow to span the distance of the short side of the building. This allowed for more units in the same amount of space, and a circulation corridor in the space left in between the interlocking units that meant that there was only one hallway for every three stories. While the decision to elongate allowed for more units in the complex, it was out of touch with Corbusier's proportions and as a result, the Le Modular designed units felt rather claustrophobic and lacking breath. However, that is not to say that the building is without its interesting moments. The giant monolithic mass is arranged on Pelotus, which is a design philosophy highly studied and advocated by Le Corbusier himself. which allows residents to enjoy the green garden space underneath the building, where all of a sudden they feel and understand the great mass of the building of which they reside in, as well as 
animals feel connected to the natural conditions of the site. Overall, the Unitady habitation was the first step in the direction of where community housing is headed today. It was born out of a need for housing, a need which still is today, and its design decisions plays a true precedent for projects today. The fact that Lake Corbusier could fit one circulation corridor per three stories was a marvel of communal housing planning. However, the execution of these spaces left more to be desired from the experiential realm of architecture. As the Corbusier took a creative and bold step in his work, many others have watched carefully and learned from both his successes and mistakes, therefore leaving a fingerprint of the unit of the habitation on many communal housing projects that stand today. For our post-COVID changes to the unit, we would organize the communal spaces across every floor to allow for the traffic in each of these spaces to be less dense. This would allow each floor to operate closer to its own ecosystem, meaning if residents want to stay on their own floor to conduct their everyday activities, they can. Thank you for watching, and we hope you enjoyed learning about the Unitady Habitation. Welcome back everyone! I took some weeks off mostly to prepare new walkthroughs and other material for you guys, but I'm back on track with the uploads and I will be publishing again every Thursday. I will go all the way until the end of the year without missing any week, and if I get to do more content I will upload more often. This time it will be slightly different, as I will be mixing contents. I will be doing some walkthroughs, tutorials, specific building concepts, videos about full cities. So you will have to tell me what content is more interesting for you. This first stop of the walkthrough series, season 2 if you're willing to call it like that, is the Berlin Unité d'Habitation by Le Corbusier. <laughs> So, in the beginning of the 20th century, the industrialization brought a lot of changes to the way people lived and how the cities were shaped. There was a huge exodus of population from rural spaces to the city, and this grew massively in a short period of time. 
UK was one of the countries that went through the biggest changes. Between 1800 and 1900, the population in UK cities multiplied by 7 in average in all the big cities. This means a city that had 100k inhabitants in 1800 would grow up to 700k in 100 years. That's unsustainable. To give you a more recent reference, between 1900 and 2000, those same cities grew in the worst case 40%, while others decreased up to 35%, with all of them peaking in population around 1950. This massive growth brought overcrowding to the cities, really low living conditions and substandard housing, also due to the lack of infrastructures. This overcrowded city type with horrible living conditions started in the middle of the 18th century and lasted until the end of the Second World War. But Le Corbusier already presented a new plan for the cities radically different to what was being built at the moment in the 20s. This concept brought big residential blocks surrounded by vast green spaces. And although he tried to build this city idea for decades, it never got fully applied or succeeded. The Unité concept was another proposal along these lines. Five units were built around the world. The first one and most famous is the one in Marseille, which packs the most concepts of all of them. The idea was to reshape the modern cities and get all the lost qualities of traditional housing, views, big green spaces and optimal sanitary conditions for all the inhabitants. Instead of that fast-paced growth of the city that doesn't answer to any living needs other than being a box to sleep with very poor conditions, he proposes to condense the program of an area vertically and to build these large units as independent small autonomous neighborhoods. And as a neighborhood, pack all necessary equipment such as shops, sports areas, recreational areas and spaces in the building and leave big green spaces, sun and views around the building. This neighborhood concept was never sustained a long time. And although some unites, like the one in Marseille, packed a lot of this program, never lived up to his expectations. In principle, all unites follow the same recipe but with small adjustments due to regulations and project constraints. I will focus on the first one, Marseille, and then compare it to the one built in Berlin because it is important to have an ideal case to compare. This building concept is a news and application of all the studies and characteristics of his works. Number one, the use of an exposed concrete for the main structure of the building that we already saw in the Ronchamp Chapel, for example, is very present in many of his other buildings. We reviewed Le Corbusier modular system in the video of the Swiss Pavilion, but basically he developed an anthropomorphic system of proportions and dimensions for all his buildings. This applied in his late projects and Marseille is one of them. He creates several different type of apartments in the same building, from studios for single people to double-story residences that span across the building. All of them use the same configuration, three floors, one interior hallway. This is very efficient because two hallways feed six actual floors, so the necessary space to access the apartments is really reduced. He also has two different balcony heights for each apartment. In floors 7 and 8 he creates a public space, a space where neighbors can spend time together among other equipments in what he called internal street. Also in these levels he creates a brisolail to control sunlight intensity. All apartments have a terrace and every terrace has a different color. The rooftop contains the vast majority of the public equipments of the building a garden and a terrace, as well as an open and closed gymnastic space, a solarium, a sprinter's truck and a snack bar. And this mix of uses is one of the concepts that survived a long time and is very alive in present architecture still. It is a very big amount of concepts that work together, 
to reshape the living spaces. Le Corbusier's proposal for Berlin includes 530 apartments distributed in 17 levels, accessed only through nine streets, which are really wide, where residents could enjoy social interaction. In the Berlin Unité, we can see three different apartment types in the section. Some of them single height, also double height, and at last the same apartment type we saw in the Marseille Unité that spans across. All of them have different variations in width to accommodate from singles to different family types. Each house has also separate balconies forming a grid that can be seen from the exterior. This allows the light to enter but protects the inside from excessive solar radiation. Unlike other unités like Mazei, Berlin has little additional facilities. At the beginning, a children's nursery, a post office, a small supermarket and a bank were included, but they do not work anymore. Right now, only a small shop in the ground floor is existing. So in principle, the Unité is working as a residential building. In the Berlin case, the rooftop allocates the building facilities. So it doesn't have any social or common use for the building. Another affected element of his approach was the modulor he used in Marseille. When built, the German building code was relatively strict with the proportion and spatial dimensions requirements. The heights had to be expanded to 2 meters 50 instead of the 2 meters 26 he originally planned. The end result didn't please Le Corbusier, and so his bris soleil and study is affected. Although a long time regulations regarding space and heights have been even more strict and higher heights have been used. If you frame these buildings in the time they were created along with the concepts Le Corbusier was proposing as a whole package of rules and equipment, you can acknowledge the value that he brought to architecture. And although these built proposals never lived up to the initial theoretical concepts, it supposed an incredible jump forward in architecture. And you can see how he influenced many architects that came after him. And this is all for the day, people. I hope you enjoyed the comeback. I will be posting much more along the year. Please like and subscribe. Thanks for supporting the channel. I'll see you in the next one. Di konsepnya Le Corbusier uh, dibangun di Jerman di bentuk uh, perumahan apa masal yang lain, tapi tadi uh, tidak sesuai gitu ya karena pengurangan dan sebagainya dan itu mengecewakan Le Corbusier karena dikurangi 20 cm yang tadinya sudah dihitung sama Le Corbusier pakai ini ya body language ya body language pakai ukuran tubuh gitu kan uh, ini dikurangi di situ demi efisien. Nah itu sama Le Corbusier kecewa karena angin yang masuk menjadi uh, tidak seperti yang dia harapkan. Gitu. Ini Walter Grovius. Ini agak, dari kita masih punya waktu berapa lama sih? Walter Grovius, oke. Okay. Saya langsung aja karena saya tahu kalian sambil mendengarkan yang lain, jadi nggak usah pakai. Dan Okay, ini. Uh, ini 14 menit jadi nanti mungkin setelah setelah film ini uh, Uh, pas habis gitu ya, jadi silahkan kalau pas filmnya belum selesai, kalian memang harus berhenti, silahkan aja uh, meninggalkan. Saya akan teruskan sampai selesai untuk me 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 memberi ut keutuhan pada rekaman di Youtube, supaya bisa kalian pelajari. Walter Gropius German architect and one of the standard bearers of the modern movement, 
As the founder and director of the Bauhaus, he exerted an incalculable influence on our environment through his advocacy of rationalization of design and construction, pure geometry, and functional beauty. Through his works, we discover that many of his principles are still a reference today. In the German town of Alfeld, Gropius made one of his first works. It is about the remodeling of a manufacturing complex, destined to the production of shoe lasts. Within the project, highlights the intervention carried out on the main building, which houses the administrative offices, which is made up of three levels topped by a flat roof. The formal solution of the facade results from the idea of freeing the external walls from their bearing function. The reinforced concrete structure retracts inside and creates large glazed surfaces and free corners, which give the composition a feeling of lightness and weightlessness. The glass facade is articulated from thin brick pillars, reinforced with metal frames. The modulation in the large windows is achieved by means of a grid composed of thin metal profiles, where a series of opaque planes, also in metal, suggest the division of the three levels. On one side, a large solid block, clad in brick, houses the main entrance to the building. The solidity of this volume contrasts with the lightness of the main facade. In this project of domestic topology, the architect in collaboration with Adolf Meyer put to the test the principle of the large construction module. In order to functionally and volumetrically solve the project and rationalize the construction process. The volumetric composition is solved from two prismatic bodies articulated between them. By presenting differences in height, the roof of the miner is used as a terrace for the highest volume. On the ground floor, the spaces of the social area, living room, dining room, music room and a greenhouse, have an open layout and without divisions, with views towards the garden. The level is complemented by the kitchen and service areas, which are oriented towards the street. The upper floor is made up of the bedrooms, in the highest body the servants' quarters are located. By seeking to establish harmonic relationships between clearly defined bodies, the heavy white volumes contrast with the openings, emphasized, through subtle dark profiles. The Bauhaus functioned as a school of arts and crafts from 1919. With the eventual closure of its first location in Weimar, the industrial city of Dessau made the offer for the construction of the building that will house the school. The team led by Gropius will project a series of buildings that will become the symbol of Neues Bauen, the new construction. We are facing one of the most outstanding works of 20th century architecture, an experimental art laboratory and architectural manifesto put into practice. The volumes are freely grouped within the architectural ensemble. The rejection of symmetry is evident. The lack of hierarchy in the whole and the appreciation of the building from different points of view is emphasized. The bodies, topped by flat roofs, are able to be linked together in a continuum. Each of them houses specific individual functions. The north side of the building acts as a technical teaching center, it is made up of classrooms. 
the administrative areas are distributed along a two-story bridge, which is supported by four concrete pillars. This element articulates the side of the classrooms with that of the workshops, where the large glass surfaces stand out. On the back of the bridge, and following the axis of the bay of the workshops, another volume is generated, in which the auditorium is arranged. Another joint is created with the element of the background, in this case a five-story building, which houses the student and teacher dwellings, and gives a vertical accent to the whole. Simultaneously with the construction of the Bauhaus building, a group of houses were erected, destined for the most important teachers of the school. The condition was to locate them in the vicinity of the complex at a walking distance from the workplace. A total of four houses were built, one of them single-family, destined for the director, the remaining three, arranged in pairs, will be inhabited by the masters. The director's house has a different layout from the rest, as it does not have a workshop, and has private spaces, such as a service room and a guest area. The houses of the masters resemble each other, down to the smallest details, the result of the standardization and normalization pursued by Gropius. The pairs are arranged symmetrically, although in a contradictory way the symmetry is broken, when one half rotates 90 degrees with respect to the other, The core of the program is a spacious workshop on the first level, illuminated by a floor-to-ceiling glass wall. The bedrooms are distributed around it. The ground floor contains a living dining room with access to a terrace, the kitchen and the services. A second level includes two rooms, before which the roof extends. The exterior of the houses is defined based on the asymmetry of the facade elements and the cubic volumes by the contrast of vertical and horizontal lines and volumes, as well as by the contrast generated between the solids painted in white and window surfaces, outlined with dark frames and internal subdivisions. complex of social housing, located on the outskirts of Dasau. The project was divided into three stages, with a total of 316 houses built. For Gropius there is an opportunity to put into practice empirically, and on a large scale, the principles of rationalization and standardization in construction, in order to solve the shortage of social housing and lower the rental price. The works are scheduled in such a way that their execution is comparable to an industrial production line. By taking these requirements into account, to reduce construction times, the needs of its future inhabitants are put aside, which is evidenced in subsequent functional and constructive deficiencies. The formal design of the facades, on the other hand, presents elements to consider. Combinations of windows grouped horizontally, in contrast to vertical surfaces, formed with glass blocks and brick-clad planes, that act as divisions between the dwellings. Within the complex, an element stands out, that acts as the focal point of the entire project, a five-story building for the consumer cooperative. It has a marked vertical character. The massiveness is present delicate openings are practiced on the facades, the railings on the balconies in the black frames, contrasting, following the language of other works, with the white walls of the building. After his arrival, together with his family, to the United States, Gropius received the appointment of director of the Harvard University School of Architecture. He built his residence in Lincoln, Massachusetts, a place close to his work environment. 
an amalgam of concepts is unified and gives rise to this project, on the one hand, the principles upheld by the noise Bauen are present, on the other, the techniques and materials of the regional and traditional architecture of the place are used. A compact body defines the composition. Only a horizontal eaves, which indicates the access, and a portico on the rear facade, break the volume. The walls are formed by means of wooden frames covered with redwood planks painted white. This traditional system is combined with the incorporation of industrial materials and elements, glass blocks, steel profiles and chrome railings are present. The program is divided into two levels, a living room, dining room, kitchen, service areas and a study make up the ground floor. The large windows of the social area establish a direct relationship between the interior and exterior space. The upper floor houses the bedrooms and a covered terrace. Inside the Harvard University campus, Gropius designed a set of seven residences to house 547 students, as well as a common-use building. The seven residences have an identical design and are formed from a reinforced concrete structure. Beige brick cladding accentuates horizontal details. The buildings are grouped around several interior courtyards in order to avoid monotony and are connected by a series of covered galleries. The main building is made up of dining rooms and recreation rooms. It has a slightly arched plant and rises on a series of cylindrical pillars. A 59-story skyscraper rises on Park Avenue in New York, above Grand Central Station. The most important railway center in the city. In a previous project, the building was aligned with the axis of the street to guarantee the vision along it. Gropius's plan differed with this proposal. The building will rotate 90 degrees, as a result, the longest axis will fully fill the width of the street, creating a great visual edge over Park Avenue. Decision that has caused great controversy since then. The building, representative of the international style, is characterized by the lack of ornamentation. The corners are slightly beveled, creating an elongated octagonal plan. Beneath the roof, a dark band like a cornice provides a perfect background to place the company logo. Walter Gropius Visionary of the Bauhaus and defender of the international movement. What do you think of the work of this architect? Any work that you think we missed mentioning? We invite you to leave your opinion in the comment box, if you like, you can also subscribe to the channel and share the video, it would be very useful. For your attention, thank you very much. See you next time. Okay, uh, pas dan berapa menit dan... Okay, kalau nggak ada pertanyaan kuliahnya saya akhiri. Is there any question? Nobody hear me? Ya, enggak ya. Oke, okay. udahnya saya akhiri ya. Sampai silakan absen. Selamat siang semuanya. Selamat siang, Bu. Terima kasih, Bu. Dicilak dulu. Oke. Okay.